And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Now the last time I had last time I had this particular gentleman on, it was o it was over a little a little horror game called Locus. But th for this, we're going a little less horror related. Specifically his TRPG set in the world of Hyrule known as, well, Heroes of Hyrule. The one and only Jack Milton. How are you doing today, man? Hello. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good yourself. I'm do I'm doing good. The um the weather has warmed up a little bit, much to my chagrin, but it's probably going to cool down la later today. And when I say when I say warmed up a little bit, I mean that it's at to, that's at um, thirty degrees. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, it's freezing here, which is good. I like freezing. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's all it's always fun. It's always funny whenever I bring up my winter weather to two folks on your side of the pond because everybody looks at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> Cuz for the last few days the highest it got was 15. Um that's fi that's 15 Fahrenheit of, of course. I and I um wow. And if I And now it's about 30 Fahrenheit? Yeah, or min or minus 1 Celsius. I see. Well, yeah, that's probably colder than it is here. Mm -hmm. um. <clears throat> but, uh... <laughs> it... Yeah, like, we're, we're, we're not in, we're not in, like, full-on freezing winter. We're just in, it's very cold at the moment, sort of thing, but not a patch on any of that. Mm -hmm. So, now with some, with, um... Now, obviously, this is not the first time. This is not my first rodeo when it comes to discussing a Zelda RPG because I had the dev forum for Reclaim the Wild on a while back. But oh, nice. Well, I'll, I'll start. I'll I'll start with this. Um. Now the la the last time that I had you on, we talked we talked about the um early introductions to role playing games. For this, I'm curious what your introduction to the the Zelda series was. Ah, okay, yeah. So um, my introduction to Zelda was watching a friend play Ocarina of Time and then playing it a bit. But I think actually my first one was Oracle of Seasons and Ages. Um, and then I kind of worked my way back and forward from there. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I still stand by the fact that Oracle Seasons and Ages are excellent. Um, probably my favourite 2D Zelda is Minish Cap, um, which I appreciate is a Capcom one, like Oracles, but um, I, I thought it was great. really enjoyed it. Um, favourite 3D Zelda was Skyward Sword, and then Breath of the Wild happened. Yeah, although so, um, I, will say some, I will say something a little <clears throat> controversial when it comes to Skyward Sword. Um, for the longest time, Navi annoyed the hell out of me, and then Skyward Sword happened, and I realized just how good I had it. See, honestly, I think is one of the better ones, and I found Midna way more annoying in-game, but that might just be because I actually found it useful knowing that my batteries were low, and I tended to change them. <laughs> um, for... I guess she does do a lot of, like, explaining puzzles. Which yeah, not great. Um, the reason w the reason why Fee is higher up on my annoying list is she says a lot of well dressed nothing. Fair. I mean, I feel like I feel like Midna gets a bit of a free pass as a game um, sidekick mm -hmm. in the Zelda series because she's basically the only character in. Twilight Princess, mm -hmm. and up until that point was the only real, like, fully fleshed out character from like the entire series, really, because she's like the first character that had like character development, mm -hmm. 
in the Zelda series at large, really. And I think she gets a bit of a free pass for that. I, I think she's a great character, but I found her very annoying as a um, sidekick, personally, yeah. in game. Um, it is. I I will admit I do I do find it a, bit, a lot a lot of times when 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 um, people are asked their their favorite three D Zelda, so many people always end up going with um, Ocarina of Time, which I think I think is go I think is going to go down as the as the um, obvious answer, mm -hmm. where the the more interesting answers are going to be the ones that differ from that. You know, it's it's yeah. it's it's kind it's kind it's kind of like it's kind of like someone being a being a being a um I guess be someone's someone being a metal fan and their and if you ask them their favorite band they'll li they'll list off say Metallica and stuff like that you know yeah. the you know the un the uninteresting answers <laughs> but. Taking that into account, what um, what was the with Heroes of Hyrule? Was that a more re, was that a more recent affair of trying to of trying to do this, or was the idea of doing tabletop um Zelda something that you had been kicking around off and on for a while? So the idea of doing it is something that I've been playing with for a few years, mm -hmm. but never really taken seriously. I never really played with, like actually developed. Um, primarily just because a few years ago I sort of thought, ah, oh, it would be really cool to have a Zelda TTRPG and like base it around D4s and have like power, wisdom, and courage be like main stats. And that was about as much as I ever got into it. I sort of thought of that and went, ah, oh, that's kind of cool, bench it. Um, and then kind of just this year, I. I essentially just had like a weekend where I kind of some neurons fired and I came up with the basic kind of layout for how the game might work and went, oh, there's something to this. That'll do. And just kind of like threw myself at it a bit. Um, <clears throat> so the idea of a Zelda TTRPG was something that's been floating around, but mm -hmm. the actual execution the realities the sort of like project goals of heroes of hyrule specifically are pretty recent um and if you read it they're pretty obviously fairly sort of inspired by a lot of breath of the wild more than anything else mm -hmm. um like i've tried to work in the kind of dna of the whole zelda series and like the ideas and concepts that build throughout but as far as sort of like thematic content goes, it's fairly kind of grounded in Breath of the Wild, which is mostly just because I think Breath of the Wild is a really good starting template for a RPG, for a tabletop RPG, mm -hmm. um, much more than a lot of the other Zelda games are. Which I could, I could definitely, I could <laughs> definitely see that given, given the more sandboxy nature and. The fact that um, Breath of the Wild has a bit of a, for lack of a better term, Wild West kind of approach. Mm. And, yeah, like it's. It, it, there's also a couple of like coincidental kind of overlaps as well. Like the the tribes I chose to include in Heroes of Hyrule are actually all of the ones that are in Breath of the Wild, but I didn't include them because they were in Breath of the Wild. Um. I, I set a metric of which ones have appeared in more than one game. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that those were all the ones that were in Breath of the Wild. <laughs> yeah. But even <clears throat> with, even with that, I th I think that um based on what I've seen so far of it, you're sh you're you're shooting for a sandbox approach where you ha you have the bullet points that one would expect from a, a Zelda game, but you're not trying to aim for a specific point in the timeline, which no. probably in part due to the fact that trying to decipher the Zelda timeline requ requires you to be hung upside down while undoing a Gordian knot. Uh, I think it's simpler than that, but that's also because the way I read the Zelda timeline is a little bit strange, I think, compared to the way that a lot of people approach it. 
Um, but yeah, like it's not a clear cut thing, and you could do, but I think you end up with a very specific thing. Whereas I was trying to kind of go for, hey, you want to play a Zelda RPG? It's like like a D and D style game, but in viral. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I was going for, like combat tunnel, exploration and fighting, but Zelda. <clears throat> and when it comes to now taking that into account, I realize that it's still fairly early in development. But <laughs> what what were some of the design goals that you had with your particular take? Because obviously you're not the first person to do it, and even even if um the other one that I mentioned is is a little more exposed, neither they are not the first ones to do this either. So I'm curious yeah. what you what your focuses are going to be on it. So, um, well, one thing I will say is that I foolishly didn't bother doing any research into whether anybody else had done this before mm-hmm. when I started doing this. So, um, just PSA: do your research, kids. Um, <laughs> but uh, fortunately, I found that they had quite. I think they had all the other ones that are kind of out there and available uh, primarily reclaim the wilds and it's dangerous to go alone um, which are I've very briefly brushed through them both and I've heard some very good things about both of them, go check them out if you like Zelda RPGs, they might be more your speed than mine um, but uh, they they're both very rules light and I wasn't too bothered about being rules light so my main kind of like my main things were one um i wanted it to be i wanted it to feel zeldery so i kind of like reference games for way things work um two i this is like a general design goal i kind of have in a lot of my games like it's always been a thing that i personally just enjoy in rpgs but i wanted the mechanics of characters to feel impactful Mm -hmm. and matter so one of the main things i wanted was you to be able to pick the different tribes of hyrule but then to have genuine like significant mechanical differences between them i i kind of feel like playing a goron should feel very different to playing a korok for example so Um, you you didn't want the D D race problem no um where they're simultaneously both incredibly problematic and also completely pointless um (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, races do so little in D and D mechanically, and I hate it. Um, Funny thing the, is, the one of... the one time that they actually did do so- they actually did do something useful happens to be the one edition everybody hates, but me. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's that? Um, I'm not, not a D&D buff. So. Um, fourth edition. Oh, okay, yeah. Fair. I think like there's obviously a lot of very deep and sensible com- conversations about the nature of how the de- uh, how races are represented in D&D and the impact that the mechanics have on that representation and things which I'm not going to get into partly because I'm not hugely qualified for that and a lot of people have said it a lot better than I ever would be able to elsewhere but uh I also think that they just don't like one of the reasons why the conversation happens is because you can remove the the mechanical differences from races, at least in fifth ed, and it makes very little difference. Um, so I wanted I wanted that impact, which is not just because I think that the tribes of Hyrule should feel different, although the tribes that are presented in the video games are hugely different, but also just because I like mechanical diversity in characters and I wanted to make it a meaningful choice for the players when they choose which tribe they want to be. Mm-hmm. Um so uh, that was one of the things. Also, another thing that I wanted to do was I, I just felt it had to use D4s in some way. It's a Zelda game, and the standard D4 is shaped like a triangle. <laughs> and and I find it really weird that no one else has made a Zelda game that uses D4s. It seems like a really obvious missed trick. Um, that, that was in there from before I knew that the other games hadn't used it, but I am disappointed that they don't. It's such a obvious hugely superficial thing and honestly i completely understand why they haven't done it all jokes aside because d4 is kind of crap <laughs> i but, uh... do um 
I do want I do wonder if the reason why some people are averse to it is because well for one the D4 doesn't exactly have the best reputation in a lot of games and two the D4 doesn't have the best rep um reputation among the among a lot of people who who um have who have had to deal with the culture problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but for me it's the one a one to four variance is kind of naff. So ultimately, if it's your only dice roll, it leaves you with very like few options as a designer. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that they roll like crap. Like D fours don't roll; they, they drop plop. on a table. Yeah, they, they just plop. Go, yeah, and then they slide maybe depending on the surface that you're rolling on. Um, so, but I felt I set myself the goal of using D fours. I wanted them in there somewhere. <laughs> So they're in there, mm -hmm. but they're not the main dice. Those were my main things. Um, as far as like my actual design goals, I wanted it to be, I wanted characters to be diverse and have lots of options um, to create. And I wanted the, the tribes to make an impact on those options. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have the combat be quite dynamic and fun because it was like the main thing. Which I I can definitely see, and when when I look at the way that the character um, sheet is designed, something I'm cu something I'm curious about is, were were you using the character sheets that are designed in um, World of Darkness as a template? <clears throat> Not so much as a template, um, as much, but fairly strong in, um, sort of sorry, fairly strong in inspiration is the word i'm trying to say mm -hmm. fairly strong inspiration from wad yeah um part not so much that i thought wad was the suitable inspiration for this as much as wad's kind of my personal rpg pedigree a lot of people come up through D, &D. Mm -hmm. i kind of came up through wad so wad's kind of like where a lot of my brain space is in terms of rpg design um, and so, yeah, I, I like five dots. I think they're really nice as a, I think it's a good scale for stats. And I also quite like the visual of having dots to fill out on a character sheet. I think it's nicer than having written numbers everywhere. Um, but yeah, like there's definitely what inspiration in the sheet. Mm -hmm. And Given that, given that, even the, what I did, f what I did find interesting is that even with that um, influence, you're still use you're still using um, a single di a single die as your primary mo as your primary modifier, um, yeah. specifically a d10. And I'm mm -hmm. cur I'm curious, what was the reason with going with a soul? Um, D D ten. Did you just did you just prefer the um, bell curve with with something like that, or was it to keep things quickly? Um, so, couple of reasons. The main thing is that um, it a lot of the roles in the game aren't going to be a single D ten. A lot of them are going to be multi D ten, especially if you're good at it. Mm -hmm. Um, but then multi D ten take the highest. Um. And mostly it was to facilitate the bonus dice of the D4, if I'm honest. Um, so the way the game sort of standard works is you roll D10s and you roll D4s. By default, it's 1D10 and 0D4, but various skills, abilities, advantages, etc., etc., can give you extra of either and both. And you take the highest of each. So your max is... Um, your max is 14 on a standard roll. Mm -hmm. And basically it was that if I was to do a sort of wad system where it was like roll a number of dice for your stat, um, for your combined stats and then take the successes, suddenly I either have to set the threshold astonishingly low to facilitate D4s being useful, or I have to set a second threshold for D4s, which is really clunky and awkward and I didn't want to do or I have to have D4s do something else and like 
I mulled around a lot of different kind of concepts and ideas for what could be the way it worked. Um, but I was quite fond of the way the multiple D10s plus multiple D4s plus a potential additional D4 for special stuff um, plus your attribute and your expertise. I quite like the way that it all kind of came together. Um, and it allows for a fairly nice bell curve as well. That means that if you've got stuff that gives you multiple D, like multiple dice, you are much better. Mm -hmm. Like the the actual probability means that you're unlikely to get a one if you're rolling multiples, especially if you're rolling like three D tens. And then if you add the D4s, you basically are never going to get a 1. Um, also, it allowed me to do stuff like D10, the D10s. If you get a 10, it explodes into an extra D4, um, which factors into the highest D4 mm -hmm. roll. Um, but it also means that I could... When I've got the sheer amount of abilities that the game has ended up having it allowed for a scaling where additional effects feel impactful but don't ultimately change my parameters as a designer. Like, I know that the maximum stats you can have are 10. The maximum you can get on a dice roll is 10 on a d10, 4 on a d4, plus an extra um, Triforce d4, so the maximum you can ever get on something is 20, 28. Mm -hmm. I know that. That's never going to change. Adding a D10 does increase people's chances of getting that max score, but it doesn't actually change the parameters at all, mm -hmm. which makes it really easy for me to balance the huge amount of skills that I've ended up putting in because there's not huge variance like there would be if it was numbers of dice where someone might have something that means that they would roll 10 dice. Mm -hmm. And if you have, like like in Ward, they have exploding successes where you can get more successes by rolling 10s. If you have that, the amount, the max amount of successes a, a player could get on a roll is technically infinite. Like, statistically, um, it's not. <laughs> but technically it is and how do you account for that when you're trying to make a balanced combat game where lots of different characters with loads of different skills feel genuinely impactful all the time mm -hmm. it becomes very difficult yeah now obviously one of the one of the main things that I that I saw that cer that certainly struck me with the design that you're using for Heroes of Hyrule is the talent system Mm -hmm. And especially with with the variety of tree, the variety of um trees that you have that you have, to the mm -hmm. to the point where I was very tempted to make it to make a joke of to make a joke of did he design did he design this tree system while playing Total War or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's a little bit like that, yeah. <laughs> It's mostly like that in, ter in terms of the in terms of the horizontal look, and you're kind of yeah. disqualified from the total war comparison because diplomacy could actually work in this game. <laughs> but yes. what was but um what brought you to this to this particular approach? Because through this, I think it would be fair of me to say that while characters certainly have a wide net. They're not necessarily a um a free. It's not necessarily full free form. No, it's not. It's relatively free form, actually. Like, mm, yeah, like it depends how you want to pay. I guess, mm -hmm. like, what you want to buy. Um, because one of the key things is is that other than the tribe talents, everyone can buy everything. Mm -hmm. Um, you, it's just that if a talent lines up with your tribe, you get bonus experience to buy those. So it's easier to learn stuff that aligns with your tribe, but you're not the only one that can learn it. Um, but yeah, so 
honestly, I'm not entirely certain where the idea came from. I think it was just, I'm, I'm a much greater fan of the sort of wad style of um, abilities and sort of like magic and stuff that you get in the wad games mm -hmm. and other similar games than I am of the sort of more class-based system in D&D. &D. So I, I like giving players options and I like asking players to design their characters much more than I like the approach of um, giving them a class and telling them what they get when they level up. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that D&D &D does have options in there, but ultimately you kind of, you pick a class and the class is pretty much in standard D&D &D until you start getting into like crazy stuff like multi-classing, pretty much decides everything about how you're going to play. Mm -hmm. And there's like options within there, like the different types of fighter and things, but ultimately if you're a fighter you know you're a fighter whereas i kind of like the idea of people being able to mix and match stuff and build their own characters and play about with that sort of thing because it felt true to zelda mm -hmm. where you know obviously you're not going to play link here because kind of my, my mandate was the hero the the hero in the legend of zelda basically has most of the talents that you can buy theoretically if you wanted to put him in the game link would have huge amounts of the available talents not all of them because he doesn't tend to have magic um at least not the way that i've done it in the trees mm -hmm. but he'd have huge amounts of these talents but the idea being that well the thing is is that the most most of the stuff that link can do other characters can do, they just can't do it all like he can. Mm -hmm. Like, bombs are not a thing only Link can use. Link is not the only one who can cook in um, Breath of the Wild. Plenty of other characters show that they can. Um, he's definitely not the only musician. So I like the idea of like throwing that stuff in and allowing people to make characters who have combinations of those in some regard. Um, and Essentially, the the actual like sort of sideways sort of tree design, it's basically just a visual version of a really really robust prerequisite system. Mm -hmm. Like lots of RPGs have prerequisites in their abilities, when they say you've got to have this ability first before you can buy this one. That's not that unusual. It's just usually not presented like this, yeah. and it's usually not complex as this because the advantage of realizing it visually before I've written them all out properly is that I can make it a lot more complex than it would otherwise be. Mm -hmm. um, I think mostly it just came from I play a fair amount of video games and I come from an art background. So a lot of my design process ends up being quite visual. Yeah which I, I certain there's plenty of designers out there that do it as well, but I know that there's other designers that kind of like, they come from like a maths background and their design comes from a place of maths and then visuals kind of get put on later. Yeah. Whereas mine tends to be, I, I see it visually, I build it visually and then I change it when I realize the math doesn't work later. Mm -hmm. um, and admit, admittedly, if I, there was a bit of low hanging fruit to make the total war joke because I could because I could have also referenced um the charm trees in Exalted, even though what you have isn't nearly as complex as some of those trees are. Oh, I have not actually seen those. Um At some point I'll need to read Exalted. <laughs> I I like it I like Exalted. Um, I'm not a, I'm not as much of a fan of the of the, of the charm trees in thir in third edition, but right. just just to give at least at least one at least one example. Um, and this this isn't mine. This is a uh, this is a fan made one. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Regarding what? Regarding the awareness ability. Okay, yeah. Wow, look at them. Oh. And that's for, that's for one ability for one type of exalt. Um, of course, something to keep in mind is that exalted is a... It is not is trying not to is trying to go for larger than life epic. Yeah. Um, that's why I have. That's why I, I don't even recommend. I don't even try and recommend it to people who have a D and D background because, yeah, D and D can get can get a bit superhero-y, but it's but that superhero-y is um more of an accident than anything else. Whereas with something mm. like Exalted, it's. It outright cites that it's trying to go for the the sort of superhero we you'd see in Greek myth. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but so, but um, something that I something that I did note is when it came to when it came to um when it came to the ta the categorization of talents is the is the fact <laughs> that a lot of a lot of the t a lot of the talents are um, are root are rooted in what tr are rooted in what tribe, and more spe more specifically, the fact that entire magic styles are dependent on um, what tr on what tribe somebody is. Mm -hmm. Um. So, the, the difference with that is, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's so. For example, fire magic talents have are all Goron. Mm -hmm. um, they're all Goron affiliated talents, but all that means is that when Gorons gain XP, they gain experience and they gain Goron experience. Goron experience can be used on upgrading their the the tribes aligned skills, mm -hmm. and also um, they can be used on to buy tribe aligned talents. However, normal experience can be used to buy any talent. So essentially, Gorons get fire magic cheaper functionally, or they get bonus experience to spend on fire magic, alongside a lot of other stuff. But any other tribe can purchase fire magic. And um, the other the other thing is that there is in character creation. There's also a um, a I can't remember what the word I used to define it was, but it's basically like your um, upbringing. Mm -hmm. And you can have an upbringing, for example, that allows you to buy magic talents like they were a tribe talent for your tribe because you were brought up to learn magic. So you can be a Hylian who's been taught in fire magic when they were younger or they were brought up learning fire magic, so they count fire magic as being a Hylian talent. But um, the only things that are locked off are the tribes themselves have an exclusive talent tree that's specific to that tribe mm -hmm. that no other tribe can buy. And uh, the Gorons have a specific set in the um, the riding tree. Um, or the I think it's animal tree actually. Mm -hmm. um, in the animal talents, they've got three unique ones, which is basically they can roll much faster, mm -hmm. which is primarily because Gorons can't ride animals because <laughs> they're really heavy. Yeah, and um, and this at uh, this this is the point where I'd make some sort of joke about the giants about the giant's knife. <laughs> <laughs> Or the or the or the fact that I I remember um, messing with messing with my messing with my uh, Game Boy Color so that I ha so that I could utilize so I, so that I could utilize the big Goron sword more effectively, which by messing with it, it's basically a means of me saying I taped a I taped a piece of cardboard over both buttons. <laughs> <laughs> How did that help? You can, um, well, for for one placebo and two and two, um, you two the whole thing the whole thing of having to use both buttons because the big Goron sword is so big. Oh yes, yes, I remember. 
uh, been a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and hey, it's more useful than than the giant's knife that get that would that would have you go through that whole thing of quests, and then the thing just breaks after three hits. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah is on. Is almost the is almost the kind of thing I would I would see if um if Douglas Adams ever wrote an RPG. <laughs> <laughs> but something I do find interesting is that even even though you've um even though you've made it clear that you stray away from the idea of a class system, you still you <laughs> still included um you still included trades with their own um set with their own setup. And yeah. when it came to when it came to doing tr when it came to doing trades, um, were th were those easier or more difficult than some of the more combative um, talent trees? Depends on the trade, <laughs> for the most part. Um, so the stuff like the diplomat one, mm -hmm. which actually is only half finished in the version that's on itch because there's a there's a a couple of um mini releases that have been released to my patrons at the moment um so some of the stuff that's missing from the itch one i have actually done it's just not been released to the public for free yet um but like the diplomat's talents are relatively easy because they're just basically a load of like unique skills Stuff like, for example, music, which I have noticed is in the version that I've apparently put on itch, which shouldn't be because it doesn't work. Um, and I haven't had the chance to rework it. The whole music system didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so music's really difficult. And um, things like, uh, like cooking. Cooking kind of like has its own full system and so does crafting. Mm -hmm. So they were pretty tricky in in a manner of things and like with cooking i had this whole kind of like matrix of what everything's doing and making sure i'm not doubling up on effects and stuff and making sure that you can kind of combine them in interesting ways uh the same kind of crafting so those were pretty tricky um and like a lot of the magic talents were relatively easy to do because again and they were just kind of like special abilities of like cool stuff you could theoretically do with a theme mm -hmm. um and i mean the martial arts were kind of tricky but i kind of started out with them they were one of the earliest things i did and some like certain ones like the goron martial art was quite easy to do because it's probably the most fleshed out one in terms of actual material within the zelda games mm -hmm. um whereas the others i was kind of like Drawing on information, but making it up. I'd, um, I'd imagine. I'd imagine yeah. something like that could be a factor. With I'd imagine that um, that a Sheikah style martial arts would be, so it would be second easiest given how given, given the influences that they have. Yes, to an extent. Except I decided to be weird and not give them standard martial art. <laughs> So, like, it's funny because the, the Sheikah martial art is, like, the least combat-based one of mm -hmm. all of them because their martial art is all about um, having duties and gaining magic back for the duties mm -hmm. alongside some other stuff, but that's kind of, like, the crux of theirs. Whereas stuff like the Goron and the Gerudo and the Zora ones are all based around stances and are kind of loosely based on real-world martial arts. Um, whereas I kind of felt like it, it felt appropriate to me that the the Sheikah's martial art was more based in the kind of philosophical martial art um, kind of what's the word uh, like the the ethos of philosophical martial arts as kind of like philosophy mm -hmm. rather than just technique that the, a lot of the Sheikah kind of um, sort of background and flavor that they've put on them in the games kind of links with a little bit better i think mm -hmm. whereas like the gerudo kind of felt like giving them something that was a little bit more philosophically similar to say krav maga which is just about 
being really effective in a fight yeah. seemed more reasonable, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like they they were relatively easy, although coming up with some of the effects for their duties was quite hard. Um, but the Sheikah have like loads of the, the thing with the Sheikah is because of the Sheikah's strong kind of connection to that kind of thing with their kind of default um, with with the flavor that exists with them in the games, especially in the Breath of the Wild version of them. A lot of the kind of stuff that you might consider being essentially the ninjutsu stuff mm -hmm. um, is actually in their tribe talents because it's so intrinsic to the vast majority of Sheikah have this um, compared to the sort of more philosophical side, which is kind of like a certain Sheikah go down that route, but a lot don't. And people from other tribes might pick it up. Because um, that's that's the thing, is that the martial arts are not intrinsic to the tribe, and other people can learn them. For example, we have seen Link do sumo mm -hmm. in at least one game. Yeah. So Hylians can learn the Goron martial art of sumo. And not all Gorons know sumo. Mm -hmm. but many Gorons might pick it up. Yeah. And it's easier for them to learn it because it's been developed by the Gorons and therefore they're kind of better suited for it in a way. So they, they And also the culture that they're surrounded with means that they probably have a base level of knowledge that will make learning it easier, but not impossible for anyone else. Which... It's a kind of general thought, right? Mm -hmm. That definitely makes sense. And... um. One of the things I one of the things I did notice when it came to when it came to the uh, when it came to the setup is <laughs> the is the um, is the method that is one of the primary methods that the Triforce is utilized in character creation the Triforce bonus effect mm -hmm. and spe specifically the fact that it's one of the it's one of the primary ways to use mad magic by having Triforce as a extra effort mechanic, essentially. And was that yes. was that something that you had decided on early early on because of the influence that the Triforce is obviously going to have? Um, yeah, it kind of came together in the sort of short I, I think I'd probably designed the sort of the, the very core bones of the system over about a week, maybe two. And it kind of came as part of that couple of weeks. The very original version I think had power, wisdom and courage be the actual like attribute stats. Mm -hmm. Uh and it just kind of didn't feel right. Um given what they kind of stand for in the actual Zelda games and in the, the sort of like the lore surrounding them. It felt more appropriate to have them as this sort of like background bonus power thing where you can draw on them. And also to have them kind of like variable between characters because we see characters kind of align with them in different amounts and different ways throughout the series really. Mm -hmm. And also I think one of the things that I find quite interesting is the idea that power isn't actually inherently evil per se. It's just that evil people tend to gravitate towards it out of the three. Mm -hmm. But the the law of Zelda doesn't really seem to hold power in a negative light in the way that it might first appear. I don't know. My, my reading of it is that the idea is that you kind of need all three anyway. So I kind of like the idea that any character could draw on those in different amounts. And it kind of built into this system where you've got different skills and powers and attributes and stuff linked to each other. Linked to those different things. Mm -hmm. And plus, plus, do, plus in doing that, it's I can I can see that being used as a means to ha have it where ma where magic can st can still be used by people who aren't um, ostensibly mage characters. Yes, 
yeah, that was a big one, actually, was the fact that it was like, oh, you should probably give, like, I, in a very early version of it, that wasn't the case. And then I realized that it was a really good way to incentivize magic being useful, especially because one of the core things of, again, the martial art tree, the first thing that every different martial art gives you is a way to regain magic. Mm-hmm. Which seemed really silly because a lot of the time the martial arts are not often going to be linked with mage stuff. They absolutely can be if you want to, but like I think a lot of the time people are going to kind of fall into one of those two lines. And like I need to give people a reason to have and use magic and to make it a useful thing. Um, and it, it, it kind of slotted in nicely there. Although when it comes to that... I would, I would actually, a counter that I would actually get, I would actually give when it comes to that dividing line approach is that, much like, um, much like J.R.R. Tolkien's work, the world of the Legend of Zelda is one that is one that has a that has an emphasis on su- on subtle magic being ev- being ever present. Mm-hmm. Um. Not to the same degree as as you would see in Tolkien's work. You're not going to see power in ju- in just invoking someone's name or something like that. But the idea that there that there is some form of magic in the in the natural world at any at any given point. So the idea that somebody is completely cut off from magic, ev- even if they're not using spells or the like, they're still drawing upon it in some fashion. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you see a lot of characters doing stuff like that in Mm -hmm. Zelda as well, like a lot of the time, Um, sometimes really subtly and sometimes really obviously. Yeah. Plus, Um, when you when you consider the fact that the that that 100 percent of the I'd say about 99 percent of the magic that's utilized that's been utilized throughout the series is th- is through uh, is through enchanted items. Mm. Re- I mean there have been there have been traditional spells but even those you you get through cer- you get through certain items. I think I think one of the rare cases where that wasn't the case was Zelda 2. Yeah. And whenever I bring this up some people bring up a link to the past but you were getting magic through medallions in that, so yeah. that still so that still counts as an, that still counts as an item. And the more famous ca- the more famous casting equipment, um, that's st- that still is going to count as magic items more than anything else. Yeah, I think it's you do see a lot of magic. It's just it's very rare that it's Link that's doing it, like. Mm-hmm. Zelda does magic in a lot of the games, yeah. especially the more recent ones. And you see stuff that could be construed as magic from all of the champions in Breath of the Wild, um, the monks. In, I mean, I, if you get the chance to read through all of the magic trees, you'll find that the vast majority of what I've put in there is... I, I'm pretty pleased with the magic trees. Mm-hmm. Most of them are things that people have done in games. Yeah. Um, or that we can infer that someone might have cast this spell in a game because mm-hmm. it makes sense that that's how X effect was achieved. Um, so, yeah, like there's a lot of there's a lot of it in there, but as you say, like it's not something Link tends to do much, and it's some. Um... Even even with uh, even with other um, ca- other characters, it's it's not it's not li- it's not like ma- the reason why I emphasize the whole subtler magic thing is to differentiate it from the from the more overt that you'd see in a lot of um, fantasy games where ma- where magic is known. You might have ma- you might have magical school schools or magic towers where people learn and. Oh, anytime somebody's casting, everybody knows that it's happening. Yes. Yeah, I think 
the the sort of the general way I've kind of gone about it with this is is that you could probably construe that a lot of the talents that aren't in the magic trees would fall under that subtler magic. Mm -hmm. Whereas the magic trees themselves are kind of much more of the over, I am a mage casting a spell kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but all of them are kind of like inspired by stuff that's in the series. Um, some of which isn't necessarily innately flavored as magic. Um, like a lot of the spells are kind of based on stuff that Sheikah technology does in Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. That's kind of framed as being tech. But given the world, it kind of made sense to me that it was essentially just technology using spells that have been kind of like either programmed in or magically built in or whatever. Um, like, well, the the big flashy light magic, um, like the the high level light magic attack spell, mm -hmm. is the guardian laser. It's the laser the guardians fire at you. Oh yeah, the one that makes the one that makes me run for my life. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's also what the um the girl on the front of the on like the um itch page and that's in the book is doing. She's doing the guardian laser. Yeah. The the Hylian mage that I've drawn. Um because I thought, well, one, if I was going to make a light mage in Zelda, I would want to be able to do that. Mhm. Mm um, but two, it also kind of makes sense that what they are is because they were built to combat Ganon. So firing light magic makes sense to me as a thing that they do. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So now, uh, one th one thing that I was one thing that I was um, was curious about was when it came to the derived traits it me it mentions for. HP and magic that if you increase your strength after creation, your HP do well, you wrote doesn't not increase, which <laughs> I think I think that's one, that's one <laughs> case of oops. But that's supposed to be does not. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when it comes to the when it comes to the that particular motif, was it a, was it a, is there do you have it intended that 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 um your HP is largely going is largely going to be set throughout a campaign or are there do you have do you have plans for other means that somebody could use to increase um health and magic? Oh yeah, there's loads. Um, so uh, the main reason why it doesn't increase it is just because um there's so many other ways to increase it that I think it would get silly if you're getting both a strength point and HP. Um, so the main one is that the worker talent tree, like it's literally just stat buffs. Um, and there's two main lines, one of which is increase your HP and the other one, which is increase your magic total. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, at the top of the talents, you've got these columns and the first time you buy a talent in the third column and the fifth column, so the middle one, and the last on any tree, you get your choice of an H of a heart or a magic. And Which I think it's written somewhere in the book. <laughs> um, I, if it if it is it's if it is I did I did not um see it. That's legit. Um probably in the bit where I talk about experience and advancement uh, but maybe not I don't know I'll make a note of it like this is the thing I don't have an editor for this because I'm doing it all alone and I can't afford other people so there's a lot of like issues like this and uh, anybody who's listening to this who reads through it who notices any please do feel free to send me a message or an email <laughs> or something it's really handy mm -hmm. <laughs> And while I can cer while I can certainly help with s with some parts, um, uh, obviously the, obviously there's not there e even I have my um my limits. Now, yeah, with with that with that kind of thing in mind, I realize that 
this is a it, this is a work in progress th thing a very a very much work in progress since since the version on itch is a is the point two but yes w but um w um when it comes to fu when it comes to future development when do when do you see the release window for the next update and what kind of aspects are you working on expanding so um the couple of versions that have seen like the the 0.2.1 and the 0.2.2 which have been released to my patreon um were primarily focused on finishing up um chunks of the talent trees that were missing so most of the talent trees that are only like half done in the 0.2 two are now finished mm -hmm. um and i tried to sort of like mop up a lot of the ones that weren't there um considering that it's now gone out to the public i think one of my main um interests is kind of like sprucing up a lot of the kind of like how to play stuff like just kind of padding it out a little bit is kind of one of the next things i want to do um sort of give like an overview of what what you need to do in character gen rather than just kind of dive suddenly into tribes um, and kind of play with that. I would love to be able to give more of a release window. Um, realistically, it's probably not going to see any major updates in the next couple of months, but I will try and get something out, I think, before March, like as an update on the, the itch version. And definitely for my patrons. The The issue is, is that um, I've got a lot going on with Cobblepuff Games at the moment. Locus mm -hmm. is hopefully releasing next week. We've got a zine quest in February, and then we're hoping to do a Kickstarter for our next game, Coffee and Chaos, March, April time. So it's kind of lately it's been full steam ahead with all of that, but I'm hoping to kind of like realign back to this soon and get some more of it done. Uh, another thing that I'd like to do is transplant it into um, Affinity Publisher to make it more effectively laid out and more pleasing because at the moment it's a google doc mm -hmm. which is a bit of a nightmare um, yeah as as somebody who uses google docs for for the weekly dockets i can understand completely like it's very useful but it ain't great for layout no <laughs> it's yeah um but there's obviously quite a lot to do and i've got ambitions that i'd love to do if i kind of like finish this version and can start looking at sort of like expansion content and stuff mm -hmm. so but i'm not gonna pretend that i'm anywhere close to that point yet oh yeah um, so, yeah and rick the other something that i um that I was I was curious if you if you had if you had plans for implementing in it is the is the matter of um of magic item creation of being able to being able to customize that is that something that you've considered for down the line um so yes and no um sorry do you mind if we hold that thought and I just run away and run to the toilet quickly? Um, um one second. Just... No and you, you... So, before I before I had to do do the quick do the quick pause, you you were mention you were mentioning about um about the potential with magic items. Yes. So, um, in terms of player creation of magic items. I've not really got any plans um, for a couple of reasons. Um, but in terms of DM creation of um, magic items, absolutely, totally. Um, the main thing is is that um, I looked at crafting. I wanted crafting to kind of be in there because you see a lot of crafter characters in um, Zelda. And it felt like it was a necessary thing to kind of like have in there. But the thing is, is... I've found I've, I've played a fair few of like, tabletop RPGs with crafting systems, and they always feel really eh. Like they kind of often boil down to this thing of you kind of make a roll to build a thing, mm 
Mm -hmm. The DM tells you that you built the thing, and then you have the thing. And it all kind of happens on the side because, realistically, you can't do it very fast, so it kind of has to happen in downtime. And as far as, like, mechanical engagement with it, you very rarely do real mechanical engagement. Um, so I kind of took out making items, especially for, for a couple of reasons and other reasons as well. Like One is you don't really make items in Zelda. Like, there have been a couple of small crafting systems in... Stuff like um, Skyward Sword had a sort of upgrade crafting system, and Breath of the Wild has some sort of elements of it. But you don't like Link doesn't make items. Mm -hmm. Characters don't really make items, and realistically, the kind of things you'd want to make are going to take so long to make that it doesn't feel appropriate to be doing it in game time. But I wanted crafting to be a thing. So what? crafting does now is it improves items you've already got which one means that crafting's not like having a good crafter in your party doesn't essentially make most of the loot you might find completely moot which is another thing they can do is if you've got someone who can just make really good swords finding a cool sword in a dungeon is no longer a big deal because you've got a dude three feet behind you who can make a better one Whereas now finding a sword is like, oh yeah, cool. Does anybody want this cool sword? The crafter can make it better. Mm -hmm. um, and also, like they're all, um, they're all, uh, sorry, all of the crafting things are kind of like temporary. Um, you can only have one on an item at a time, but you can swap them out and they use resources and stuff. So it means that crafters constantly have a job to do. It's not just a one-off, one-and-done thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do stuff like um, you can enchant items with different elements once you get high enough on the crafting tree. But you can do all sorts of different stuff um, with the way it all works. Uh, but the idea was kind of this concept that really the characters who are in it aren't going to get much out of like at least gameplay wise they're not going to get a huge amount out of making stuff but i think that there's quite a lot to be gained from improving the stuff that you find and tweaking stuff so that your party can more effectively use it or so that it's a bit more exciting or so that you've got like a range of different items um so yeah like there are a couple of things you can do like um there's one for making bombs mm -hmm. And there's one for making arrows um, because they're kind of like one-offs. But in terms of sort of magic items, those are something that's been added in in the later ones. They are essentially objects that give you a talent for free. So like a bomb doesn't really work like equipment does. It works more like a unique talent node that says, you can do this attack that does this. And the same with stuff like hook shots and things. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I can, I can, um, I can certainly see, I can certainly see that, appro that approach. Um, and I'll, de I'll definitely be keeping an eye on how, th on how things develop in the, fu in the future. But, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time to come back up to the temple and brave the hell of time zones to enjoy, to enjoy the show here. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. <laughs> and, of and of course, any time anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open up here. Well, thank you very much. And of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>